Welcome to The Law, Your Money, and You. I'm Roberta Sapphire, an attorney in New England. And I'm Camille Barron, a financial coordinator, also in New England. And Roberta, as we all know, the economy today in this country is very different than it was years ago. One of the things that sets us apart is innovation. Yes. And one of the things that people have to think about when it comes to innovating is protecting their ideas. Right. And we're going to hear more about that today. We sure are. We are so blessed. Did I say that right? Or are we blessed to have Gary Bloom, an attorney, specializes in patent law. And welcome, Gary. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me back. Do you, do you want to tell our viewers a little bit about yourself? And then we'll get right into it. Sure. Um, I'm an intellectual property attorney based in Boston. I've been practicing for about five years now, and before practicing law, I was a software engineer and a sales engineer, and technology and law are my two passions. Right, and he's well-traveled and well-spoken. He's also my nephew, <laughs> so we're very lucky to have him. He <laughs> broke from his busy day just to be here. <laughs> well, let's, you got 50 million questions. Yeah, so here's the, here's the main thing, when it comes to intellectual property what do people need to consider when they're creating something new they have a new idea an, an invention or whatever it is how do they protect their property well it really depends different things get protected in different ways if you're an inventor and you want to protect your invention you would protect it with a patent if you're an author or an artist and you want to write a book a screenplay write a song you would protect it with copyright law if you're a businessman and you want to market your business, protect your brand, you would protect it with trademark. And if you have something that you want to keep secret, like Coke's recipe for the Coca-Cola, that would be um, protected by trade secret law. Wow. So depending on what you want to do, there's mm. different ways to protect your so all these intellectual property. Things. Aren't there different departments in the government mm. too? Uh, one for copyright, one for patent, one for is it all different? And and also, I want you to tell our viewers what intellectual property is in case they don't know. Sure thing. So intellectual property is an abstract property. It's the type of law that protects these abstract ideas, right? Like inventions or um, artistic and creative works or branding, such as the different types of law we've talked about before. Now you're right. Different areas of the government work with people to protect different things. So patents and trademarks are gotten from the United States Patent and Trademark Office, or the USPTO. The Library of Congress manages copyrights. Mm. Mm. So maybe we could go through, and if you can think of an example of each, to illustrate sure. how it would work for each of those types of protection. Sure. Um, well, one of the examples that's come up over the years is say a Coke, can of Coca-Cola, right? You have some secret formula of Coca-Cola. It's what's known as a trade secret and it's protected by um, non-disclosure agreements. Basically, everybody who knows the formula has to keep it secret and they're bound to that, bound to that. So that's trade secret law. The can might be designed from a special type of metal that won't rust. So someone invented that and they got a patent on that metal that's made in the can. Mm -hmm. Now the shape of the can might be special mm. and um, the shape of the can, maybe images, marketing images of the can could be copyrighted and thus owned by Coca-Cola. And the branding of Coca-Cola, everybody knows the, the name Coca-Cola. Mm. Coca-Cola is many things but it's also a brand and it's also, it's a trademark. Mm. So it would be, pat it would be uh, protected by trademark law. I, I have a question. Um, say you have uh, not Coca-Cola, but but another name like uh, George's beer. George's beer, and it's known throughout. And now another fellow by the name of George is making a beer, and he wants to use George's beer because that's his name. So make it even more George Brown's beer. Isn't there, isn't there a trait, different trait, like Calvin Klein jeans, and yet there's another guy whose name is Calvin Klein, and he's making jeans, and so he wants to make jeans. Now, isn't there something 
And is that a patent or trade or what, where does that fall in? So that would be trademark law. Trademark. You're always entitled to use your own name to do business, but you can't confuse people by it. So trademark law protects, protects branding and, and marketing, but one of the aspects of trademark law is it's supposed to prevent the customers from being confused about what they're buying. So Calvin Klein jeans, everybody knows Calvin Klein jeans. It's a worldwide known brand. If a fellow named Calvin Klein wanted mm. to sell his own jeans, it would be hard for him to do so even though it's his own name because Calvin Klein is a world known trademark. There's different uh, categories of trademarks. The, the, the stronger the trademark, the easier it is to protect. There's different, um, four so different strations. So now the next question, which does happen, especially in today where people travel, they go to Cancun, they go to there. Now say, does that, you say worldwide, does Cancun or France or this have to um, s follow the law that the United States has on Calvin Klein jeans? I mean, we're just using Calvin Klein jeans, sure. Coca-Cola. Did, did they give reciprocity? That's a good question. Officially, the laws of the United States protect things only in the United States. But the United States is also a member of many treaties and agreements with different countries around the world. And that's what gives us reciprocity. So like, for example, the US copyright law protects works only in the United States, maybe not in Europe, but there are agreements such as the Berne Convention and such that, that will allow foreign countries to honor our copyright protection. And it's similar for trademark. It, for trademarks as well. Okay, now the next question is, this is our activity coloring book that is, it's gone viral through the Massachusetts police towns. What do we got, 22 towns that we're doing this for, plus one in North Carolina. Mm. Now, somebody said to me, well, you should copyright it or register it. Now, what, what do you do with a book like this, and can anybody just do another book like that? What, 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 are, what are our rights? Not that sure. we're going to do anything about it, but sure. who knows? <laughs> so copyright law protects creative original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible medium. So mm. that book is already protected by copyright law, oh. Okay, as it is. There are advantages to registering your copyright. Typically, if you wanted to sue someone, because that's what the copyright actually gives you. It gives you the right to prevent others from doing certain things. Only you can do certain things with your work. And if they do things they're not supposed to, you can sue them. In order to go to federal court to sue someone for copyright infringement, the government requires that you at least register the copyright first. And there's a small fee, $35, I think, to register a copyright on a literary work like that one. Um, the trick is it's better to register for copyright sooner rather than later if somebody does infringe and you need to uh, bring them to court, you don't have to have registered beforehand. You can register and then go to court. But if you've registered beforehand, then that opens up greater liability for the infringer. Because you could say it was registered, they knew it was registered, and what happens is it kicks in that the damages that are available to you as a result are much greater if you've registered your copyright before the bad guy, the Does infringer, infringes. Does it expire? Infringes. Like the copyrights, mm -hmm. trademarks, and uh, patents expire? Everything is different. Standard oh. copyright protection is 70 years after the death of the last surviving author. Oh. Yes. That's a lot. So this book, so, so that's for individual authors. Hmm. If the uh, work is owned by an organization, then it would be 120 years from the time it was published. Oh. Okay. Patents are different. Patents are right now 20 years from the date of filing your application to get a patent. When you want to get a patent, you have to file an application and you go through this negotiation process with the government, the USPTO, to, to get your patent awarded. So but you can make a robot and get a, because uh, that's what they're doing now, lots of robots, and uh, that's a patent, right? Mm -hmm. So after 20 years, people can copy your robot? Well, what happens is there's this concept of the public domain. And whatever is in the public domain is freely available to anyone and everyone. So certain copyrighted works, once their copyright has expired, because over historically the, the lengths of copyrights have changed, but as of 1978, it's this um, 70 mm -hmm. years beyond the death of the last surviving author. 
if something is no longer covered by copyright law, it falls into the public domain. Oh. If the term of a patent has expired, it's in the public domain. Do you ever hear of anybody taking it and mailing it to themselves or other people and telling them not to open it up as evidence? What was that for? That's for? what they call the poor man's copyright, and there's oh. no legal merit to it whatsoever. <laughs> okay. The only way because to... Because I got an email asking that. Sure. <laughs> Again, as soon as you have taken your original work of authorship and you've fixed it in tangible medium, whether it's writing down the words of a song or writing a letter to a friend, whether it's making an audio recording of a song, once mm. it's fixed, once it exists outside of your imagination and it exists in the real world, it's protected. The only difference is whether or not you choose to register it with the Library of Congress. So, Interesting, there, there were a couple of cases within the past year or two about songs. Uh, the most recent one was about the song Stairway to Heaven, mm. and um, Led Zeppelin recorded that most recently. And back, I think it was in the 70s or the 60s, there was another band called Spirit that recorded a song that had a similar introduction. And so Spirit, the lead singer, or the one who wrote it, sued Led Zeppelin for copyright infringement, mm -hmm. lost the case. And one of the things that came out was that intro actually came from a classical music composer way, way back, maybe in the 1700s. So technically you could say, well, both of them might have gotten their idea from that. Well, that's the trick, right? If, when something's in the public domain, anybody can use it, right? But say, let's just say, when I don't know the facts of that case, so let's assume that Spirit had copied that intro from the public domain. The question becomes, did Led Zeppelin copy it from the public domain, which is fine, or did they copy it from Spirit, in which case that's infringement? Yeah, right. Uh, and then there was so another one, th the, and the result was different. Um, it was uh, Robin Thicke had a very oh, popular yeah. song a couple of summers ago. Bur Blurred Lines was the yeah, name of it. Yeah, Blurred, yeah. And um, I, like the, that uh, I think it might have been Marvin Gaye's family. Yes, um, yes, they sued yeah. him. For a very similar thing, the, they, the song they won was or they settled. Very similar. I yeah. think they lost. I think the uh, Marvin Gaye's estate won the case in that one. Yeah. So it's kind of what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of stuff that's yeah. subject to interpretation by the court, right? Well, that's a good. That's a is good. Is that all the federal court? It's all the federal courts. Yeah. So one of the tricks is this. <clears throat> so copyright infringement can be, you can infringe someone's copyright by duplicating it, which is what very obvious to people, right? If you mm. take somebody's, your music CD and you make a copy of it and you give it to your friend, you're infringing the copyright of the people who made that CD. Mm. But it doesn't have to always be an exact duplicate. It can be, it just has to be what's called substantially similar. And if it's substantially similar, that's close enough for the courts to mm. find infringement. Hmm. So that's why you might write a song, someone might hear your song and write their own song and if it's close enough to your song, it could still be considered infringing. Hmm. It's like plagiarism. They yeah. take the... Yeah, uh, that's right. It could they be. take the mm -hmm. uh, thing there. Why is there uh, a separate office patent? I was uh, doing a little research. Patent and trademark. And, and then there's... Why does patent and trademark fall under one office and copyright a separate office? That's a great question. I can't tell you that I know for certainty the answer, but I can tell you I gave it some thought. And oh, that is, good. <laughs> that is, patents and trademarks are handled differently than copyright. Patents you have to work for. You have to file an application, and it gets examined by the government, the USPTO, and you have this negotiation of whether or not you're going to get a patent. So they, it's called examination. Um, the same goes for trademark applications. If you want to register your trademark, you have to file an application, and you have to convince the USPTO to give you a registered trademark. Copyright is different. The Library of Congress, there's no examination. You say, this is my original work of authorship, and they say, okay, you get your copyright registered. Mm -hmm. So the two processes are very different. What else is in the Library of Congress? Just copyrights? Or? As far as I know. Really? Isn't that interesting? I'm sure there's other things going on at the Library of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, from an IP standpoint, they just do this copyright registration. It's all federal government. So these are yes, all federal, federal government. Have there been any changes over the last decade or so in terms of how these laws are applied or interpreted? There have been lots of changes over the years. I'm most familiar with the changes that have happened in the patent laws. 
Um, the most notable difference, the most notable change over the last four or five years has been the, the introduction of uh, the American Vents Act. And at, through the AIA, the American Vents Act, the United States changed from a first to invent system to a first to file system. Oh. Mm. So it's a big change, but that puts us more in line with the rest of the world. Mm. And basically what it means is, in the old days, if you had an invention, you could kind of keep it secret and wait and see and, you know, wait for someone else to maybe try to use your invention. And then you could go back and say, well, wait, you can't do that. I did this 10 years ago and here's all my proof and I can get an invention, I can get my patent retroactively. They, but that cause a lot of problems. The government wants to encourage and incentivize people to come forward and quickly file their mm -hmm. patent applications. Mm -hmm. So now we've gone to this first to, inf first to file system. So it helps, like I said, get us in line with the rest of the world and helps inventors come to market sooner and say, okay, I'm filing my application. Because what a patent is, it's a negotiated agreement between the inventor and the government. And the government says, you share your invention with the world, or mm -hmm. at least with the United States, and in return for that, we'll give you this patent which allows you to sue people and prevent them from doing certain things with your invention. So now, with the, uh, the, uh, with the Internet and the hacking that's be become more and more predominant mm -hmm. over the last decade, uh, I would imagine there's much more of a risk now because of that. We're at risk with regards to what? Uh, somebody, say, from another country, hacking, hacking into someone's invention that might be up, you know, they might go into their account or something on the internet. I suppose you could look at it that way. Um, the, the ability of people to hack into computer systems is a huge problem in general. There are a lot of criminal aspects to it. There are a lot of socioeconomic aspects to it. Uh, with cyber terrorism, I taught a, or assisted a, facilitated a cyber terrorism cyber crime class mm -hmm. at one point, and it's scary what can be done through the internet. What yeah. about where they have, like, uh, two questions. Uh, one is, uh, how long does it take before the patent gets approved, and is that why they put patent pending on things? You see that a lot, patent pending. Sure. So there's a couple different types of patent application you can file. If you mm -hmm. file the full-blown application, that will eventually get examined by the government and could reward you with a patent. It can take anywhere from six months to a few years before you get your first response after you filed right. your application. The Patent and Trademark Office is very overloaded. Um, also, mm. the, go the, the, the PTO is divided into different groups, what they call art sections, depending on the type of invention, right? So if I'm an electrical engineer and I create an electronics t invention and I submit an application for it, it's going to be an electronics expert at the PTO who looks at it. Fascinating. Because they have mm -hmm. to do that, right? The whole idea is, in patent law in general, you want somebody who's specialized in that particular area of science or technology looking at your patent application when you're at the government because you need to understand it and know whether or not the person should get a patent. Sure. You know? Well, you know, you know what's interesting, too, is that you become an attorney and then if you want to uh, practice patent law, you have to get more education and then take another exam. So you can't just say, I mean, it's a spe it really is a specialty. For those people, the viewers who are interested, there's, you need a law license to practice law. You need to go to law school and get a law license to practice law. And for patent law, it's different. You just need to have the right science or technical background to qualify to sit for the exam. Then you sit for the exam, and once you pass, and you pass a character and fitness evaluation, you get this federal license that allows you to practice, uh, be, to be a patent but agent. But you have to have the background. You've got 20 years engineering. But that's not what got me. It's my oh. undergraduate degree in electrical engineering that qualified me to sit for the test. Oh, oh isn't that, right? that interesting? Oh, yeah. oh. Now, now, would you say in today's world what amazes me is the schools, high schools across the country? I mean, they never had it when my kids went. Uh, to school, but this robots. I mean, we were looking up the other day. There's a robot to mow your lawn. There's a ro I, mean, I can't wait to get my own robot. <laughs> 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 I remember when the computers came out. I said if the price went down, everybody would have one. I can't really. I can't wait to get my own robot, either a, 
a robot uh, to drive me, a robot. They have in robots to pack the they cat. They already have self-driving what, cars. What would, what would you, uh, we had uh, the young fellow on the show, Tom Canty. Yeah. I forget what his Easton? robot did. Yeah. They throw balls or whatever yeah. it is. What would you say, would you know what is the biggest uh, patent pending out there? I mean, what are they doing? Is it the robots? Is there something new? You know, about trans going in time, you know, and instead of taking a plane, you walk through the door, like the fly movie. <laughs> <laughs> so the transporter uh, would Vincent be pretty Price cool. Or whoever it was. <laughs> I don't think anyone's invented that oh, no, just it yet. Was, it was the other guy. What was the guy's name in the fly? I didn't, I didn't see it. I what? didn't see it. Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wasn't that going to help me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs> Crash. But the, the thing to be aware of yeah. is um, Terrible. Well, some of the laws for protecting your invention are different in the United States than they, they're still different in the United States than in some other countries. And although there's a couple different types of patent applications you can file, if you file, so like I said, there's this non-provisional application which you can file, which starts the process of you getting your, your application. The day you file it, you get this filing date, and that's because it's a first-to-file system, they'll look at the date that you filed your application. Um, there's also something called a provisional application, which is like a simpler, pared-down version of an application. And when you file that, it gets you also a filing date, but it will never get examined. It will never yield a patent. What it is, it's like a placeholder, which gives you up to 12 months, or actually with changes in law, up to 14 months, after which you file a regular application, a full-blown application, really? to then get your patent, start the negotiation process with the government. How many people do you think work in that patent office? Right, I think it's a big job? building. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious. You know, it might be one little guy in glasses <laughs> behind the desk, or it might be 50 of them, you know, 49 out to lunch and one working. If I had to venture a guess, <laughs> I, would rent, I would guess that there is probably a few hundred people really? who do nothing but examine patents all Isn't day long. Isn't that fascinating? No, I have really a question. Is. I'm, I'm you thinking have a patent? of patent. Didn't you have a patent or something? Jim? Your husband? A patent? Didn't he, wasn't he inventing something? I don't know. I don't oh. think so. <laughs> well, just as a side note, just be aware. So the way the laws are in, in the United States regarding inventions, right, you, if, if you disclose your invention, say you've got a wonderful idea, if you disclose your invention in the United States to anyone else, you only have one year from that disclosure to actually file an application and get an application filed with the government. Because if you wait more than a year, you lose rights to your invention. Oh, let me let me let me ask you. So you have to be careful. Yeah, um, one of my sons you have two. One of the, one of them, he he invented a game or something. Sure. Like for the beach or mm -hmm. something like that. And and I forget whether he was patented or copywriting it or trademark it. Uh, what, what would what would you do with that? Like inventing a game, a new game. So if he has an invention for the game, he could try to patent the actual equipment for the game. He could copyright the directions, the rules for the game. And if he gives it a name and wants to market it, he could try to get a trademark for the branding. Oh, that but it's not a patent. That would be a trademark. Well, he would get a patent on, he could try to get a patent on the actual equipment itself. Oh, isn't that interesting. Depending on the, how it's configured. I remember speaking with him about what he was doing. Yeah, let's not disclose it. We won't disclose <laughs> anything. Because I don't but, know what's happened with it. But this, you know, <laughs> if, if I have this special, you know, everybody knows what a cup is, and I decide yeah. that I want to make a special cup that's twice as high, I could put in a, a patent application to try and get a patent on my new improved cup. I just want to mention one thing about the basics of patent law. We should talk about it just a little. The basics of patent law, if you have an invention, it has to be what they call novel which means it's new. No one's ever done it before. And it has to be non-obvious, which means anybody who's used to dealing in that type of area of technology or science wouldn't say, oh, I could have done that in my sleep. It needs to be clever. It needs to be creative. It needs to be more than just what anybody would have thought of. So though those, these, these, are some, blah, these are some of the requirements mm -hmm. for getting a patent. Also, the way that the patent laws are written, there are certain bars certain statutory bars that prevent you from getting a patent. So, for example, you can't get a patent on cloning now. After the American Invents Act, it's part of the legislation that, you, that, that inventors are not entitled to um, patents on cloning because, you know, it's kind of a moral thing that they decided to legislate. Um, and then you can't 
patent abstract ideas. You can't patent the laws of gravity or mathematical equations. There are certain things that are too abstract for you to patent. You've got to be kidding, because kid that's you know. what we're into now. You've got to be kidding. But that is, that is fascinating. Yeah, continue. You, but you really continue. know. He, yeah, I'm you amazed really, at how yeah. he knows everything. He's so just fluent. He did that. that. He was on the show before in Chapter 93A, yeah. which I can't tell you how many people still email and call us and ask us, so what was that 93A? What would I go, the episode, I tell them, go, go refer to Gary Bloom, because <laughs> we're on archive.org. Why didn't you tell me you have such smart people in your family? <laughs> <laughs> you are. You already knew that. No, that I did. That He's I did. on our advisory board too. I know. He's I brilliant. Know. We're also in Boston through uh, him. The Boston Cable Imagine is that. now through Gary. Mm. You're gonna work mm. in some other towns, spending. Yeah. Time <laughs> time. It's in the works. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of them. Did did you do you want to wind up and and um, you know have you got to be kidding? You, I, I interrupted you, which I usually do, oh. <laughs> but to say, oh, you've got to be kidding. Um, just in quick summary, if the viewers have inventions they want to protect, they should talk to someone who does patent work. If you've written a song or written a novel or painted a picture, you know, you can look at registering copyright to protect it. Um, copyright law applies to photographs. If you have photographs on your website, you may want to protect them. Yeah. Speaking, speaking of this, and you've got to be kidding, part of the you've got to be kidding thing that we were going to use is that people are dying their pets. Oh, my god. You gosh. know, instead of dying their own here, they're dying their pets. That's just wrong. No. no. That's just wrong. <laughs> no. You're supposed to say you've got to be kidding. You've got to be oh kidding. My god. No. You've got I mean, to they're, be kidding. they're dying their pets. So is that, uh, is, is that whoever maybe manufactured the, uh, the, the formula for the pet dying, <laughs> what would they do with that? The formula for the pet dye would probably be protected by patent law. Isn't that funny? And the branding would be protected by trademark law. <laughs> and if they had photos of the dogs that are dyed, they could protect those with copyright law. Oh, isn't that, isn't that something? Well, then that's uh, so fascinating. It is. This is such a great topic. It's such a lot a to great talk about topic. in a short period of time. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and, you, and Camille wraps up. Yes. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you very Pleasure. much. Yeah, thank you. And I'm sure that our viewers uh, will have some questions because everybody's thinking about yeah. these types of things nowadays. Absolutely. So to our viewers, thank you for watching the show. And if you have any questions or would like more information about protecting intellectual property, please send us an email and we'll make sure that Gary Bloom gets it and will reply to you. And Please remember that we get your to the topics, the ideas for the topics from our viewers. So we'd love to hear from you if you have any feedback or any ideas. Because remember, this is your show. The law, your money, and, and you. you.